and we are live welcome everyone to this live stream thank you so much for watching thank you to my patreon supporters they keep this channel going they make awesome interviews with awesome guests like professor lisa ray beal possible professor ray beal is professor of old testament at wycliffe college in toronto where the weather is absolutely beautiful i just checked and probably should have done this interview in person uh, she earned her bachelor's from northwest bible college or ended from taylor seminary and phd from the University of St. Michael's College. Her research focuses on Israel's life in the land and the exile. She spends a lot of time studying and writing on First and Second Kings, Joshua, and the Psalms, and is currently preparing a commentary on Jeremiah. Professor Ray Beal, or Lisa, as I'll call you, I'm very glad to have you. Thank you, good to be here. Anything from that introduction you need to add, remove, modify, embellish? Uh, no, not at all, although I am originally from Vancouver, which is even more lovely, I would say, in its weather when it's not raining. So, Yeah. Yeah, if we do this again, uh, I'm coming up to Canada. <laughs> well, please do come. So your bio says that you're preparing a commentary on Jeremiah. Is that with Baker? Yeah, it's the Baker Old Testament commentary series. So I've been doing, working on that. I mean, they're multi-year projects, and yes. it's... Uh, the, the biggest book in the Old Testament, but I'm also doing a number of papers uh, along with the research. So maybe I'll have the manuscript finished next summer is what I'm hoping. Next summer. And when did you start that? Mm, five or six years ago, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I think people can lose uh, sight of how long it takes to produce these commentaries. So it has to be a labor of love, but also tedious of five to six years on Jeremiah. That's a long time. The Baker commentary, uh, I think it's what BCOT, Baker, Baker commentary on the Old Testament series, that's an excellent uh, series. And it's good to hear that you'll be contributing to that as well. Yeah, um, you I think it's, it's a great blend of scholarly, but with a real sensibility for people who are asking questions of faith as well. Mm. And you've done some editing already for that series, right? Yes, uh, myself and David Firth, a colleague in Bristol, we're co-editing the historical book section. Okay. So. Excellent. Yeah, that, it's had some great scholars publishing under it and uh, some great editors too. I think Bill Arnold um, mm -hmm. edited the uh, the commentaries on the Torah. So excellent. So the manuscript, um, about six years after you started working on it, you said next year and then uh, on to publication, editing and publication after that. Mm -hmm. So I guess within the next two years or three years or so, we can look forward to uh, to that commentary. Yeah, I hope it will be out uh, in that time frame. Excellent. Well, one thing I found is that conversations with uh, interesting and thoughtful people pass very quickly. So uh, let's get right to it and make the most Sounds of our good. time. There's another commentary series called the Story of God Biblical Commentary Series, which I also recommend. I want to get out there uh, for people who don't know about it. And you wrote the commentary specifically for the book of Joshua. And uh, in your commentary and in the series more broadly and even in newer commentary series, the Baker commentary series we were just talking about, readers are going to find words that they may not be as familiar with in other commentaries like narrative, uh, narrator, uh, plot, story, a story of God, mm -hmm. biblical commentary series, after all, is what it's called. Um, in your bio, it talks about being a narrative critic, among other things. So can you first acquaint viewers with what those terms signify in terms of your methodology? Sure, sure. Well, I think it's important uh, to, to even step back and to recognize that before the modern era, the biblical text had been read as a grand story. Um, in the modern era, and especially with the rise of historical critical study, the focus shifted from looking at the narrative and its uh, great themes and its beginning, middle, end, and it began to look at questions behind the text, questions of history, uh, what really happened, um, who wrote it, when did they write it, how did the book come together, and that really um, dominated the field up until about the mid-1900s. And uh, at that point, uh, particularly influenced by some movements in English literature or literary studies, um, biblical scholarship began to ask questions again about how did the book, as it is presented to us, as it comes to us in the pages of scripture, um, how does the book work? What is its message? Um, 
And narrative analysis is one of the ways that those kinds of questions can be asked. And especially in the Old Testament, where so much of it is a, a story, so telling us um, uh, the acts of God through story rather than simply didactic teaching or through poetry, um, narrative analysis really suits so much of the Old Testament. And it asks a number of questions such as, uh, how does the plot build? Uh, what is the opening, the introduction? What is the initial problem that the plot is then going to pursue? How does the plot build to uh, a highlight? Where is the denouement or the epilogue? It asks questions about how is the uh, author communicating through the voice of a narrator? So the, the, the voice in the text that's saying this happened and then that happened and then that happened, that's what we refer to as the narrator. It pays attention to how characters are being characterized. Sometimes the narrative will say, this character was deceiving people. Sometimes it doesn't say that, but the character's actions or sometimes their words or how other characters interact with them might lead us uh, the narrative would lead us to maybe the conclusion that they were acting deceptively. Um, it uh, will often pay attention to the repetition of key words, not things like and or but, um, but in, for instance, the Jehu narrative in 2 Kings 9 and 10, the words shalom, uh, wholeness, uh, peace, uh, peaceableness, uh, is repeated over and over again. And all of these are ways, um, observing those things are ways that we can look at how the narrative has been put together to communicate as a part of the way that the narrative as a whole is communicating its message. Uh, Marshall McLuhan, a great Canadian here in Toronto, uh, taught at the university here, said the medium is the message. And we certainly see that in television and in advertising. And the same is true for um, the, the narratives that we see in the biblical text. Often the message of the text is tied into not just didactic statements that are being made, um, but how the story is told, um, where it's silent, where it invites us in to ask questions. And all of that is the artistry of the story to communicate a message of God. Yeah, a couple things to, to bring out there. You mentioned artistry and, and mm -hmm. some see interpretation as an art, whereas uh, many have considered it more of a science. You know, you apply these tools of, uh, you know, the grammatical historical method yeah. or whatever, and then you come to a conclusion. What's interesting about the, the methodology you described is that it's very intuitive. If we were to read a novel, if we we're to watch a movie, we would interpret those mediums just in the way that you said. Mm -hmm. We would watch for the plot. We wouldn't expect the bad guy in the movie to say, hey, I'm the bad guy. We find that out by the things that they do or don't do, say, or they yes. don't say. It's very interesting, but it, and there are lots of features of just communication that we know intuitively as well. Um, yet when we come to the biblical text, it's, it's as if sometimes our minds go blank and, yeah. uh, and, and we just don't apply things that we know are true. Yeah, um, and I think a lot of that is because we have been so influenced by the modern project, which was focusing almost to the exclusion of other things on the history questions and the history of how the text came together. And certainly as I do a narrative method, I pay attention to the grammar I do pay uh, attention to some of the questions of history uh, because my conviction is that while these narratives are artfully told, they are in some way really uh, communicating uh, events that intentionally, um, that, that did happen, assuming the narrative is not like a parable or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, there are books that have been written um, one for the Gospels that's really helpful is, I think, reading the Gospels wisely by Jonathan Pennington. And he has in there a, a structure that can be applied to any biblical narrative that basically helps people step through how to read the Gospels in terms of narrative and uh, mm -hmm. commentary series like uh, the Story of God really put that sort of uh, method 
into play and show people how this is done. So, so that's that's very helpful. Yeah. Um, and and going back to reading scripture as it was as it was written, and as you mentioned, uh, the old way, let's call it, um, from the the influence of uh, you know German scholarship and so forth. With almost you come to uh, the halfway point in a verse. Okay, break that off there. That's part of this source, mm-hmm. and you end up with a very fragmented picture of. Uh, the biblical text, when yeah. in reality, it's been very carefully uh, put together. Yeah. And then you can see books like Joshua, as you make clear in your commentary, where Joshua fits in to the narrative. But as you said, there's plenty in your commentary um, on the Hebrew text, mm-hmm. on syntax and grammar, and there's plenty there also about the ancient Near Eastern context. So it's it's kind of uh, the best of all the worlds. But as we think about uh, the the concept of narrative, um, I'll throw kind of a, a curveball at you now, because as we get into Joshua, um, so much about Joshua that we know, I think, and maybe I'll use uh, scare quotes with no, comes to us from maybe Sunday school tradition or something else. And there's kind of this clickbait headline on uh, on online where you can say, you know, it's not what you think or mm-hmm. uh, you're doing it wrong. At the risk of sounding cliche, there's a lot in Joshua that's not what you think. Okay, so as we open the narrative of Joshua, uh, we have the big bad Canaanites who are like the worst people who have ever lived. And beginning in chapter two of Joshua, we find this story of a righteous, God fearing Canaanite woman named Rahab, as well as her family, and um, eventually. For those who don't know, she hides some of the Israelite spies. She lets them escape uh, later on after, and after she sends the, uh, the king's men on a wild goose chase. And then she says, um, now, for saving your lives, I want you to spare my life and my family's life. And they mm-hmm. say, okay, that's fine. Here's a, a signal, and you just you know show this signal when we come back to the city, and we'll save you and your family. So you have this this God fearing Canaanite, who then shows up again in uh, chapter six, and to use some of what you said earlier, the narrator there mm-hmm. proudly tells us that she's still part of Israel. So this would be, I, th- I think, what what some would call a counter narrative. You have upon entering the Promised Land, the story of this righteous. Canaanite, and there are lots of factors that we could add on to this with some of the unrighteous Israelites. Mm -hmm. Um, So how does the story of Rahab fit in the narrative? Why is it so long and Mm -hmm. detailed, and and what function does it serve? Yeah, yeah, great questions. And it it is, it's a fabulous story, uh, very uh, thoughtfully and carefully put together. Um, I think it's important to note that she has the longest sustained speech in the book, except for Joshua. So that highlights how important she is. The fact of the matter is that in some respects, we could jump from chapter one to chapter three, skipping over the Rahab story, and we wouldn't necessarily skip a beat. So we have to ask, why is it there? Why is it the second chapter? In the first chapter, they've said, you know, go in and take the land. Uh, There's this understanding that there's going to be uh, warfare against the Canaanites. And then we have this great big long story of this clever uh, woman who uh, assists the, the spies, as you said, and through doing so saves not only herself, but her whole family. Um, In that narrative, when she talks about um, the Israelites coming into the land, and she has heard the stories of how they escaped out of Egypt, Um, she um, uh, gives praise and magnifies the Israelite God. In fact, so much so that you would almost think that she's the true Israelite. And some of the Israelites, such as Achan in chapter 7, who is a true Israelite, is really not acting the way that one would think a true Israelite should. And and I think that's the point of the story, is that um, if we've come into the book thinking that Israel is going to just wipe everyone out because they deserve it or something, this story, the story of Rahab, right off the bat says, think again, that's not what's happening. 
that's not what this story, the book of Joshua, is about. So it starts undercutting uh, a number of assumptions that we often bring to the book. And, and we could add, it's not just a one-off either. We could add more examples of that. We have uh, Shechem later on. And um, you, you use the term Israel and true Israel. And that's kind of the question that, yes. that another question that this narrative raises. Um, and but then the, the question, Israelite. Yeah. the, the yeah. question gets even more pointed in chapter eight, I believe, when yeah. there's some reference to all Israel, uh, native and foreign born or something like that. Yes. Um, so again, Joshua is not what it seems, but, but really, so, so first of all, with the ambiguity about who Israel is, is that, is that really something that we should consider uh, unique to Joshua. I mean, you you do work in the Psalms as well. Psalm 87 is one that talks about those from Egypt and Babylon being called uh, native born, you know, Jerusalemites. Um, when Israel left Egypt, they, there was a mixed multitude that went with them. So, mm -hmm. so what is an Israelite in Joshua? And mm -hmm. is this ambiguity limited to Joshua? Is, is Israel, is it too much to call it a theological category of those who um, are worshipers and, and followers of, of Yahweh? whether or not they're in the covenant technically or not. Yeah, yeah. And and that's that's what I'll answer first, because the book of Joshua is really, I think, intentionally telling us that being an Israelite is not uh, merely predicated on being in the land and being biologically descended from the family, family of Abraham. Rather, uh, the book is opening that up so that the true Israelite is the one who acknowledges the God of Israel, who um, uh, worships God of Israel, walks in obedience to that deity. So Rahab, who is a Canaanite and uh, living in the first city that they are to take, probably some kind of military outpost, she really is being held up as this paradigm of one who understands uh, who the Israelite God is, who Yahweh is, and worships him, uh, uh, credits him with great power, credits him as being uh, the Lord of all the earth. Um, chapter 7, Achan, the true Israelite who is disobedient to God, and um, ultimately he and his family uh, pay the, the uh, a punishment. They're, they're actually killed by the community. Um, but he, his disobedience almost destroys the whole community of Israel. At the end of chapter 8, as you mentioned, there is a covenant renewal ceremony. And twice in verses 30 through 35 or thereabouts, it talks about both the Israelites and the foreigners who are with them making this covenant. So we're seeing in this book where we often come to it thinking, oh, there, it's anti-foreigner, it's pro-Israelite. Um, the, the book is undercutting that all the way through. Even um, if you go through chapters 13 through 19, uh, where the land is being divided up and we've got all the lists of the towns and the, the boundaries. It talks about um, individuals uh, or groups such as the Archites and they remain in the land. And actually in the time of David, there is a, a very wise counselor who David relies on who is from that people group, that foreign people group. And he seems to have become somehow part of Israel. There's the Gibeonites in chapter 9 who um, deceptively uh, uh, present themselves as being from far away. And they say, make a covenant with us, Israel. And Israel does. And this uh, foreign group of people becomes incorporated in over time to the people of Israel. And in the very next chapter, after they've deceived Israel into making a covenant with them, uh, the other foreign uh, groups within Canaan uh, attack the Gibeonites. And Israel says to God, should we help them out? And God says, yes. And so chapters 10 and 11, where there's uh, large uh, sweeps of warfare throughout the south and the north, is really precipitated 
by uh, Israel stepping up to um, defend this covenant partner of the Gibeonites who are uh, non-Israelite. And even at the very end, and it's all throughout the book, but um, as they are preparing to go into the land, there are two and a half tribes that wanted to settle east of the Jordan. And the land that had been promised to the people of God was west of the Jordan. Their request to say east of the Jordan is um, um, very distressing to Moses. He calls it rebellion. Uh, there's a concern that God is going to be um, so displeased that he's going to wipe the people out and start over. But they get through that and God says, OK, you can settle on the eastern side of the Jordan. And these two and a half tribes keep popping up in the book of Joshua. And they're often presented as utterly faithful to Moses, to Joshua, to the people. They uh, are the first tribes that go through the Jordan River. Uh, so they're in the van of the army. Uh, and at the end of the book, when the land has rest and uh, Israel has sort of made their initial claim on the land, the eastern tribes are released to go back across the Jordan with Joshua's blessing. And it, it's a demonstration that you don't, um, an, an Israelite is not only people who live west of the Jordan in the land of promise. That these Israelites, while they chose to live east of the Jordan, are still part of true Israel. When they go back across the river, they build an altar and the western tribes are very upset about this. They feel that it's unfaithful and they go to, um, uh, the, the threat is that they're going to wipe them out in warfare. And the eastern tribes say, no, 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 no. Our concern is that when we go back east across the Jordan River, you're going to say that we're no longer part of Israel. So we've built this altar really to remind us and to remind you that we are part of the covenant of God and we want to worship God. So there's this tension that the book of Joshua teases out in a number of ways around what does it mean to be the people of God? What does it mean to be an Israelite? And it's not just ethnically determined. It's certainly not determined primarily by whether you live in the land of promise west of the Jordan River. It really is uh, what is your relationship to the God of Israel and whether you want to walk in obedience to that deity. Yeah, and I caught myself in the way I phrased that question, even after the introduction, talking about narrative criticism, that basically I phrased the question asking you for a, a technical definition of what is an Israelite in Joshua. But as you just said in your answer, it doesn't tell you what an Israelite is. It shows you. It shows and so if you want to ask, OK, is can a Canaanite be an Israelite? Well, here's the story of Rahab. Um, yep. Does geography matter? Well, here's the story of the two and a half tribes who settled east of the Jordan River. And so it it shows you, I think, from 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 perhaps our modern Western perspective, we want that, you know, systematic theological definition of, of what is an Israelite. But like you said, critically, it comes down to what is your relationship with Yahweh? Yeah. You know, that yeah. that's what matters. And uh well, this, this comes up again, I think, in a different way towards uh, the end of, of Joshua, but we're not there yet. Um, the, the book of Joshua contains, as do a number of other ancient Near Eastern texts, different forms of hyperbole. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you could give sort of an introductory level um, description of this. So a couple of examples would be, you know, an army, uh, you know, so-and-so goes and marches against so-and-so and defeats so-and-so in battle. And it happens in like one day. And yes. in reality, they traveled 200 miles and the battle was probably fought over a series of days. But uh, so timelines are compressed. The uh, the extent of the defeat is often exaggerated. Um, and we see in Joshua, you know, so and so is, is wiped out, but then they show up again later. And the narrator uh, doesn't sense any tension uh, with this. So could you introduce us to the, the concept of this ancient Near Eastern war hyperbole? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's such a crucial part of hearing the book of Joshua well. Um, 
Uh, and, and the crucial part is identifying the characteristics of its genre. So if I tell you a story and that story begins once upon a time, then you have an understanding right off the hop that there's probably going to be a wicked witch and there's going to be a princess and a prince and, you know, so we know it's a fairy story. Uh, we've often missed the genre of, or the um, influences uh, of the genre of the book of Joshua. It is a narrative, certainly much of it is narrative, but much of that narrative is told in the tone of what is known as an ancient Near Eastern conquest account. We have numerous uh, conquest accounts from the ancient world, and we begin to see many of the very same characteristics that you have just mentioned. So armies covering hundreds of miles in a day and arriving fresh and ready to have uh, uh, several battles. Um, we see the uh, language of total destruction. We utterly destroyed them. Um, we see the natural elements of sometimes the sun, moon, and stars. Uh, fighting on behalf of a particular army. And all of these were common tropes that were found in these ancient Near Eastern conquest accounts. And we see the same kinds of things in the book of Joshua. Uh, and they were understood as hyperbole. And the hyperbole telling more than really happened. They, we utterly destroyed them. It's like when Canadians uh, talk about a hockey game and they say, and I'm not a hockey fan, so, <laughs> but I am a Canadian, so I know about hockey. And we, we would say, we utterly destroyed them. We totally took them out. The forwards, the center, the goalie was just toast. That's hyperbole. And that's what happens in these ancient conquest accounts. And the purpose of this hyperbole is to elevate and lift up the deity on uh, behalf of whom uh, the army is fighting, or in whose name the army is fighting. So that in the book of Joshua, when we see uh, the Israelites fighting and doing so as the people of Yahweh, it's this hyperbole is showing how big and strong their deity is. It's kind of like the way a kid would say, my God is bigger than, my dad is bigger and stronger than yours. It's hyperbole. Uh, because we want to elevate and highlight, magnify the person about whom we're talking. And in the book of Joshua, the ultimate goal is to have you, the reader, be persuaded and drawn in to worship this powerful, magnificent deity that does these marvelous deeds on behalf of his people. Mm. Yeah, genre is so important, and that's a great example. And I've thought about that as well. If you begin a story with Once Upon a Time, your expectations are very different. Yeah. If we were to read a, uh, a an account of World War II, uh, you and I would have very different expectations mm -hmm. for what the account says. If it's written by a competent historian, then I expect 95% of what's in that to be fact. Some of it they get wrong, I'm sure, but you you expect that. But there are different expectations as well that the uh, chronologically proceed, uh, chronological order proceeds linearly, mm -hmm. right? Um, that when it says forty thousand people died, that's you know plus or minus several hundred or several thousand, but that's a very close number. There's nothing that that starts off um, the book of Joshua, for example, um, that that gives modern English readers a clue about the genre. And yeah. so commentaries like yours are, are very important. Otherwise, what ends up happening is we read Deuteronomy 7 uh, that, that talks about utterly wiping them out, making no covenants with them, and then continues to give them instructions on how to live with the people in the land that they were supposed to wipe out. We read this story with Rahab where the first thing that they do when they get uh, into Canaan is they make a covenant with the Canaanite, which was prohibited by Deuteronomy 7. And so at face value, we're just left with confusion, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we, we just see tension there. Yes, yeah. And that's yeah. why that idea of that genre is so important. And even if we don't know about ancient Near Eastern conquest accounts, we can still determine 
that the extent of the warfare is uh, told in hyperbolic fashion, if we're really careful readers of the text, because the, the loud uh, music or the loud voice of the text is, and we have summaries where it's, it sounds like they went in and they absolutely killed everyone and they took over all the territory. But then we have places where there's a, a, a quieter voice, but it's a consistent voice throughout where the people that in one verse, they say they utterly destroyed them, sometimes in the very next verse, there's still survivors there. Well, how do you square that? One of the ways you can do that is to say, well, the biblical text is obviously doesn't know what it's doing. It's unreliable. But when you see that happening repeatedly, another explanation is that when it says they utterly destroyed them and then the very next verse, there's still survivors or a couple chapter late, chapters later, there's survivors from the people who supposedly had been killed or at the beginning of the book of Judges, they're alive right. again is to say, well, maybe there's a hyperbolic statement going on here. And we use hyperbole quite a lot in our own language and understanding of the world and our expressions about hockey and so on. So it's not really that much of a leap to make that, uh, draw that conclusion that something hyperbolic is being uh, uh, stated in the text. I don't think that these, uh, the word uh, heron that uh, refers to complete destruction. I don't think that occurs after chapter 12. Uh, several times we find linked statements about destroying a city and its king. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, John Walton has talked about kings as identity markers, yeah. where somehow uh, total destruction was related to uh, the king. If you if you wipe out the king, then you have uh, eliminated eliminated the identity marker. People would rally around um, for for that that group. Um, and he uses uh, 1 Samuel 15 as an example of this. Mm -hmm. What do you say about, am I wrong about um, Harem not occurring after chapter 12, uh, the, the command to utterly wipe out? Is there any significance there? Do the kings play a special part as some sort of identity yeah. marker? There's a long list of kings in uh, chapter 12. I think it is. Yeah, and it is true when you look at, so the first 12 chapters are really where the, the, the warfare is going on. So it's not unusual to have that kind of language sort of highlighted in the first half of the book. Um, when you look at where the warfare is directed, it's primarily directed towards uh, strategic centers such as Jericho, probably some kind of small town or some kind of military outpost. Um, against uh, larger cities. So in chapter 10 and 11, where there's a southern sweep of battle and an, a sweep of battle through the North Territory, it's often uh, primarily directed towards cities. Uh, the summary in chapter 12 of the battles that have happened, it's talking about cities and kings. So it does seem to be that the, the warfare strategy, which makes, I think, a lot of sense, is that when you go into a territory, you want to target um, places of high population, the cities and uh, the kings, as, as a way of sort of uh, crippling the leadership, if you will, to um, forestall any mounting of uh, future resistance. And I think that's a lot of what is going on. And again, the harem command and its execution is uh, cast in hyperbolic terms. So the intention was not that they would go in and absolutely wipe out every Canaanite, and nor is that what happened. We have repeated texts where it talks about they utterly destroyed them, but they're still alive. Sometimes the next verse in chapter 10, there's a couple of instances of that. And we also have sort of a, a, another layer of texts back through Exodus and in Deuteronomy, where it talks about God himself driving out the Canaanites ahead of Israel. And that could be intending to... Uh, when the report of the Israelites came and people such as Rahab heard about it, it's quite possible that people ran away from the cities if the anticipation was that cities and kings were targets 
it's not uh, uh, out of the realm of reasonableness to understand that this driving out of the Canaanites was really moving them out of the cities. Maybe some of them came back afterwards or were uh, displaced to other areas. So, I heard an Israeli official uh, several months ago was being asked uh, what the what the military objective was, and, and he said to wipe out Hamas. And the reporter said, "What does that mean?" And he said, "Well, basically eliminate the standing armies." He said, "You don't have to kill every last uh, terrorist." And yeah. my my th my mind went to Joshua immediately because I I track on this topic a lot, and I thought. Well, there's there's a very modern example of yes, the, the yeah. same sorts of categories that uh, these ancient Near Eastern texts communicate in. Before we move on to the the next topic, um, you've mentioned a couple times. I just wanted for clarification, uh, Jericho possibly being a military outpost, and people may be confused by that because mm -hmm. uh, you know the the bigger the walls, the wider the walls, the taller the walls, uh, the better the miracle. There, I heard a, a sermon um, within the last couple of months. Um, on Jericho, and I think the walls were broader and taller than I've ever heard. Uh, so can you please uh, explain yes. that possible uh, confusion that people may have there? So if if you have kids and you watch Veggie Tales, uh, Josh and the Big Wall, that's an excellent example of that. The walls are tall, they're broad, they look like medieval walls almost. They're just monstrous. Uh, I didn't grow up with veggie tails. I grew up in the era of flannel graphs. That's how old I am. But it was the same thing. The flannel graph picture of Jericho that I remember was a huge monstrous wall. And that actually is just doesn't comport with what we know of walls in that era and even some of the archaeological record. So quite likely what was going on was that they had either casement walls, which is sort of a kind of a sandwich where you'd have an inner wall and an outer wall and they'd be filled with rubble in between. And in that in between the, the casement is where you would put houses uh, or sometimes they would build houses there. So think of uh, Rahab's house in the wall and that could be indicative of a casement. Uh, another way that they would sometimes do it is that they would build the houses uh, butting up against one another and the outside wall of the house would then form the sort of the outer wall of the city and there'd be a settlement in the center. Uh, in both those instances, the, the walls could be like, you know, a couple stories high. Uh, possibly there was some um, rubble of a preceding wall that they had built on top of, which could have made them a little bit higher. But they're certainly not the massive, impregnable walls. And I, I think it's unfortunate when we feel that we have to portray them that way, because the miracle that the account uh, relates to us is not that great big, huge walls fell down, but that the walls of whatever size fell down at a specific time and in response to specific and unusual actions by Israel. So the miracle highlights that God was in control. And I, I, I think uh, a two-story wall of a city that falls down uh, is just as miraculous. Whenever I hear the walls getting bigger, I keep thinking, Rahab must have had a massive house. A massive house, <laughs> yes, with a very long cord for the uh, spies to shimmy down. So uh, there's lots about land in Joshua. I think that mm -hmm. this may be something that's one yeah. of the most difficult things to relate to a Western audience. The more land I have, the more time I have to spend mowing it. Um, but there's a lot about the land. Yeah. And especially when we talk about how much space a narrator decides to uh, dedicate to a topic. The second half of Joshua is, you've already alluded to this, but several chapters of very detailed description of who gets what land and mm -hmm. where. Mm -hmm. um, can you make this topic of land uh, more perhaps uh, significant, more meaningful uh, to us uh, Westerners, many of whom live in urban areas, and explain why it is that uh, similar to the account of Rahab, uh, the book of Joshua has decided to dedicate so much space to this topic. Yes, yeah. And I do a little bit of tongue-in-cheek uh, grilling of my students when I teach Joshua, and I ask them, what 
uh, passages in your Bible do you turn to when you're up at 2 a.m. and you can't sleep? So they, you know, the assumption is you go to the boring bits if there is such a thing in the Bible. And I say, how many of you would say Joshua 13 through 21 would be there? And the honest ones will put their hands up because it is just list after list after list. But the point of these many chapters of these lists is to show that the promise of the land that was given to Abraham and reiterated as they enter the land in the beginning of the book of Joshua has come to full fulfillment and that God is now um, uh, appointing the different territories to the different tribes so that they can settle and become this light on a hill, if you will, to the nations uh, around them about what it is to be a righteous people. Uh, within those chapters, there are a number of different sort of mini narratives that, uh, so Aksa, who is a, a daughter of Caleb, is there. Um, and there are some other ones that have little vignettes that talk about people of faithfulness. So there's a story of Caleb and his uh, eagerness and willingness to take the land, even at his ripe old age. And these stories stand alongside this testimony of the lists that God has been faithful to his people. These stories are people, uh, stories of people who have shown faith. Some of them have not shown faith, and so they lose out on receiving land or they don't um, receive all the land that was uh, committed to them. But it uh, comes along beside that to say, yes, God has fulfilled his promises, but it's these people of faith that have stepped forward and trusted God's promise and have uh, taken the land and received it. There, there's almost from a from conquest to the land uh, disbursement, there's almost a sense of kind of, of whiplash of... Um, Okay, now in the second half of Joshua, as they're inhabiting the land, what does being faithful look like now? Um, well, and, and, yeah, and it's interesting that sort of in the, not the geographical, well, not the narrative center of those chapters, but sort of at a key point in those chapters at chapter 18, uh, they are assembling before the Lord at Shiloh and their, um, the country is brought under their, uh, their control. Uh, so they've made some kind of initial claim, but they gather at the place where God's tabernacle is going to be. So sort of at the, the center, at this key moment, right in the middle of the distribution of the land, that's where the focus turns. It's to Yahweh and the worship of Yahweh and obedience to him. And then as the um, distribution of the land ends, the very last um, uh, chapter 21 is a distribution of the territory uh, cities scattered throughout all the tribes for the Levites who were to lead the people in teaching them about God and to um, uh, lead them in worship and so on. So again, there's that focus on the right worship of the right deity. And as the book ends, Joshua is urging them. And he says, you know, God's followed through on his promises. The important thing now is that you uh, serve God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, choose who you're going to serve. For a, a God who has done all this for you, brought you out of bondage in Egypt, sustained you through the wilderness, even though you're, you, you're uh, parents were so unfaithful, brought you into the land, uh, has established you in the land. What else can you do but worship this kind of deity? And, and so he calls them to worship and he renews the covenant with them. So at these key points in this distribution of the land, it really is about the worship of Yahweh. That's what makes an, a true Israelite. Well, That's what life in the land is to be. You've brought us to the end of Joshua. Now let me uh, read a verse. Your, your bio talks about uh, a love of preaching. So I want to know if you would preach. I want to know if you would preach. Uh, you are not able to serve the Lord uh, to your congregation. That, that's from 
Joshua 24, 19. Mm -hmm. And it, it strikes me as an ominous ending um, to the book of Joshua. Um, pessimistic, perhaps. So mm -hmm. could you comment on that and then tell us where does covenant faithfulness go from here? You do work in Jeremiah Kings. Yeah. Can you tie this narrative together for us? Sure, I, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, it's, it's a, a wonderful themes that uh, to, to preach because they do resonate, I think, so much with our lives today. So Joshua, at the end of the book of Joshua, renews the covenant with them. And he calls on them to do a couple things. One is to love and serve God, to worship God. And the other thing is to put away their idols. That means he knows that they have idols with them. And they've been with them. We, we learned from, what is it, Acts 7 or something, that they brought them out of Egypt with them. So these people who have been rescued by God already uh, have their idols pretty secure in their lives. I think that's one of the reasons why he says you're not able to serve the Lord, because you can't serve God and these idols at the same time. Choose you this day. Who are you going to serve? It's interesting. At the end of that chapter, they say, no, 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 no. We want to serve God. So, so there is a, a right heart response there. But it never says that they put away their idols, their foreign gods. In Jeremiah chapter 5, he uses the exact same term, you are serving foreign gods. So as they're going into the land, they've got these foreign gods with them. At In Jeremiah, on sort of the brink of them being moved out of the land under the covenant discipline of exile, we, we discover that they've still are serving foreign gods, and they've picked up many others as well, Baal being a chief one in the book of Jeremiah. And in the book of Jeremiah, um, two things seem to be central to them holding on to those foreign gods. One of them in chapter two is they don't remember they, 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 don't, they don't ask about this God who brought them up out of the land of Egypt. They, they're a forgetful people. And part of that is, and Jeremiah repeatedly emphasizes this, that they don't listen. Their, their ears are shut and their hearts are so hard. They will not listen and they are inured to the word of God. And because of that, they will go into exile. And the hope is that the exile, the, the trauma of that exile will shake them in a way that they have not been shaken and will not be shaken because they won't listen and they won't let go of their idols and that they will renew their love for God and the realization that God is the one who brought them out of Egypt and sustained them and brought them into the land not Baal, not Asherah, not any of the other deities they've been worshipping. And on the brink of them going into exile, God says, I will renew the covenant with you. I'll make a new covenant. I'm going to restore what has been lost because you haven't listened. I'm going to restore what you have messed up because you've been in adulterous relationships with other deities. And it's this moment of utter grace in the midst of darkness. And I think that is indicative of this God that is held forth in all of the Old and into the New Testament, is that we tend to be an unfaithful people. Our hearts, even when we want to serve God, so often can lead us astray. Uh, we often would rather do anything else but listen to God. And yet the call of God to us is always to come, to listen, to be attentive because he loves us and wants to be in relationship with us and will and through the old testament has found ways to restore relationship that has been lost and doing that because it is through the witness of these people and the story of these people that the promise given to abraham that in him in his seed all the earth would be blessed all peoples would be blessed and as you move through the Old and into the New Testament, that seed 
is held up to be Jesus Christ, who is a fulfillment of God's uh, way of rescuing his people from their own hardness of heart and their own idolatries. And I think that speaks of us today as well. Given that answer, it, it makes me think of Joshua's statement as more uh, prophetic. Mm -hmm. You are not able to serve the Lord. And that it's an excellent example of, of what you mentioned earlier in terms of narrative criticism, where the narrative does not say that they put their idols away. So what, what does the narrative say? What does it not say? Yeah. I'm familiar with several scholars who, of course, the, the New Exodus theme in the Gospels is, is very well known. Um, several have also proposed some sort of a new conquest uh, theme as well. Uh, Ricky Watts in his book, Isaiah's New Exodus in Mark, um, lays out some of these. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them or not, but are there any uh, reflexes of the book of Joshua uh, in the Gospels? And um, how do you read and, and preach Joshua productively today? Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly uh, chapter three and four in the book of Hebrews um, brings us right back to the book of Joshua, um, that we um, are, are being called in Christ to enter into his rest. Mm -hmm. But like Israel, we can be disobedient and refuse to do so. So I think the book of Joshua uh, uh, reminds us that God is always calling us and making a way for us to come into uh, rest into wholeness, into the shalom of the garden and relationship with God. And that hasn't changed. Uh, and it is possible now through Christ. Um, I, I think uh, in, in a world that is so full of distraction uh, and Christians that are being pulled every other way, there's so many things you can do on a Sunday besides go to church. There's so many things that can take your time besides reading the Bible or praying, doing those things that are the obedience in uh, long obedience in the same direction that disciple us as believers. And I think these books remind us that God's heart is always to win us and to woo us and help us find ways by his grace to grow into the likeness of Christ to enter into rest. So I, I think that's a really important piece for us today. Uh, I, I think any preaching of the book of Joshua, um, I'm, I'm an Anglican and unfortunately the lectionary just uses, I think chapter one and two and chapter 24, the renewal of the covenant. But I would love an opportunity with a group of people that I know to preach through the book of Joshua. And in doing so, you, you must, I think in some way, have some preparatory work around the warfare question because it is one of the most troubling questions. Um, New Testament believers often don't read it, don't know what to do with it. So I think it is responsible to, to do your homework and spend some time acknowledging that this, this is what is known as a wicked problem. Not that the issue is wicked, but it's hard to resolve. And to acknowledge that and say, here are some ways. And I know your work with um, um, uh, Dr. Hawk was engaging that a few weeks ago. And then I think it's important in preaching through the book of Joshua to, um, to, to hear the different voices. That it's, it, is more, it is about more than just the warfare. It is about what does it mean to be the faithful people of God. And it's not your ethnicity. It's not what land you have or where you live in that land. It's about your heart relationship to God and following him. That's an excellent note to end on. And for viewers out there who are wondering uh, what it would look like to see Professor Lisa Rayfield preach through Joshua, there is a series of video lectures um, that, that she has done. I know it's on Lagos. I don't know uh, mm -hmm. where else that's available. I'm sure you do, but... Uh, that, that would be easy to find uh, for anyone who uh, wants to look look those up and uh, and uh, go through the book of Joshua with Professor yeah. Ray Beal. Uh, Lisa, it's been a wonderful conversation. Uh, hopefully, it's been helpful. We've brought some some helpful resources up and uh, addressed some important topics and and uh, perhaps the most important topic, uh, the struggle to be faithful to God mm -hmm. and uh, His faithfulness to us in spite of that. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and 
hi to everyone and I hope this has been helpful to you. Thanks. And thank you all for watching. Check out Professor Lisa Ray Bill's bio in the description box to see more of her work. Definitely check out her commentary in Joshua, the Story of God Biblical Commentary series, as well as the other as well as the other resources we mentioned today. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.